Let's take a look <coughs> at nerve and membrane potentials. Okay. Nerve and membrane potentials. So neurons conduct electrical impulses, which is pretty amazing if you think about it for a minute, right? So inside our, <coughs> our nervous system, we have cells that can conduct electrical impulses. When I was a child and I first learned that there was electricity in my body, I thought, gosh, this is really right. There's electricity in there. I'm like, where did the electricity come from? For a while, no kidding, for a while when I was a kid, I thought that maybe my parents plugged me in at night, right? Because I knew about charging batteries. And I thought, well, it's night when I'm sleeping. They're plugging me in. And so I asked my dad, no, we're not plugging you in, right? Uh, so what we want to do is where do these electrical impulses come from in our nervous system. How can nerve cells generate electrical impulses? In order to do that, we've got to go back and talk about basic principles of electricity. Huh? We need to think about how electricity works, then we can go to nerve and membrane potentials. <clears throat> Somewhere you've learned that in the universe there are positive and negative charges. You knew that already. And you knew from somewhere that unlike charges attract, and light charges repel. You were in kindergarten, they let you play with some magnets, you tried to put two positives together and they pushed apart, right? But if you went positive and negative, they snapped together, right? So unlike charges attract, light charges repel. The greater the charge difference, the greater the attraction or repulsion, right? Makes sense. Try to go here. Uh, the closer you get, the greater the attraction. Remember playing with those magnets again, right? You had plus and minus, got them closer, 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 all of a sudden, snap, right? So the closer you got, all of a sudden there was more and more attraction. If we want to pull the magnets, if you will, apart, pull charges apart, it requires energy, right? Remember pulling on those magnets? It took a lot of energy to pull them apart. So to separate unlike charges, energy has to be put into the system. And once we separate the charges, they have a tendency to want to come together. We can use that energy to do work. And so we can say that the charges contain potential energy. And the potential energy that's, that we have, we call voltage. Okay? The tendency for the charges to come together, we call that ener energy voltage. We call it a potential difference. So uh, electrical sockets in the wall, there's a potential difference between the two sides, right? So if you stuck your keys in there, don't do that. If you stuck your keys in there, energy would flow from one side to the other. There's a potential to do work. We call that voltage. If you did stick your keys in there, they would be a conductor, and they would allow the electricity to flow, right? So they would allow the electricity to flow and as those electrons flow through that conductor, we're going to call that flow the current. We're going to call the flow the current, and we're going to measure the current in a unit that we call amperes. And the symbol that we use for that is an I. So the current can be measured in amperes, and we use the symbol I. Any conductor offers resistance to the flow of those electrons. Okay? So a conductor offers resistance to the flow of those electrons. Years ago, I got a phone call from my younger brother, and he said, Gary, how can you tell when someone's been electrocuted? I said, well, they're dead. He said, no, 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 they're just shocked. Uh, and I said, why are you asking? He says, well, Marcy, my youngest niece, was in the other room, all of a sudden I heard a loud snap, the lights went out, and she's holding keys in her hand by the socket as she's crying. And I said, well, are there any burns on her hand? No, there's no burns. Well, then she's fine. And then I proceeded to scold him because I said, well, how come you don't have nice plastic covers in all of those sockets, right? If you put a plastic cover in there, it's connecting the two sides. How come electricity doesn't flow from one side to the other? It's a really bad conductor of electricity. It has a very high resistance, right? There's a very high resistance there. So any conductor has some resistance. 
turns out there's some superconductors essentially that have zero re resistance or close to it. But otherwise, any conductor has some resistance. And the resistance that is offered by the conductor is measured in ohms. Okay? So we measure the resistance in ohms, and we can use the symbol R or sometimes omega. That brings us to a law of electricity called Ohm's law. And Ohm's law says that the amperage in the system is equal to the voltage over the resistance. Okay? The amperage in the system is equal to the voltage over the resistance. If you think about that for a minute, it's exactly the same equation that you put on the quiz today, where we said flow is equal to the difference in pressure, difference in potential energy, over resistance. Do you see? It's the same equation. And so here I'm trying to show, it's hard to tell, but I'm trying to show an old picture where they had water in this big tank. The steam engine would come along, and so the water in the tank represented energy, potential energy, right? It's up there high. The pipe out of there is the conductor for the water, and it's going to offer resistance. When they lower that down, water will flow through and we can measure the flow. And so we could do this, right? It's not, this is not complicated mathematics. If we had a system that had 200 volts in it and there were 50 ohms of resistance, we could figure out how many amps, four amps. This is not difficult math, right? Straightforward math. And sometimes, you know, I have students say, oh, I don't understand electricity. Just think of it as water. Think of it as water. The potential difference, right, is the voltage. That's the difference in pressure. The flow is the amperage, and the resistance is ohms. That's no different than our bulk flow law, right? Same as, as we talked about before. Bulk flow, urinating, movement of air in and out of your lungs, that's bulk flow. Right? Electricity, the bulk flow, is the flow of electrons out of the system right? into whatever apparatus that you're using. All right. The resting nerve cell. If we take a nerve cell that is re at rest and we check the voltage that's between the inside and the outside of the membrane. So intracellular to outside. We check the voltage across there because when you talk voltage, you have to have a potential difference, right? They have, the charges have to be separated. If we check, what we find is that inside the cell, it's going to tend to be negative, they're trying to show here, okay? and the outside of the cell is going to tend to be positive, and the net charge between the two sides, we say, is Minus 70 millivolts. How much is a millivolt? A thousandth of a volt. Minus 70 millivolts. We say minus because the inside is negative relative to the outside. If you talk to somebody in the electronic industry, folks, they're usually pretty impressed by this. You can't see a cell membrane with a light microscope, and yet across that cell membrane, from inside to outside, there's 70 millivolts. And in the electronics industries, they go, wow, well, that's a lot for a little tiny membrane to have between it, right? 70 millivolts across that. Inside the cell, in the intracellular fluid, there are fixed anions. So these are proteins that can't get out, and they have a net negative charge on them. Okay? So inside, there are these fixed anions, and we know that anions will attract cations, right? Anions will attract cations because cations have a positive charge. This diagram is also showing us that we have lots of potassium inside the cell and lots of sodium outside the cell. We knew that already when we talked about the cellular compartments the other day. So it turns out you have these fixed anions inside the cell, and it turns out that the membrane, the cell membrane, at rest is quite permeable to potassium. 
Yeah? Turns out there's actually two different channels for potassium to move through. And this diagram is trying to show that the channels can open and close. But so here's a, a channel that, that's open. And when we look at these protein channels for potassium, there are two different types. At rest, one of the types of channels is always open, whether it's at rest or not. The other channel for potassium is closed at rest. So one would be open, and then one channel, this is trying to show the same channel, but one would be open for potassium, one would be closed. And when we look at sodium channels, one of them, there's only one type, and it's going to be closed. We call these gated channels, because they have little protein gates on them that allow molecules to move through or not move through. So again, think we're at rest. There's two types of channels for potassium. One's going to be always open. The other one is closed at rest. For sodium, at rest, there's only one type of channel, and it's closed at rest. I'm not saying there's one channel. I'm saying there's one type of channel. Thousands and thousands of these protein channels on the neuron, right? But only one type for sodium. It's closed at rest. Two types for potassium. Yeah? What do you mean by rest at rest? The nerve is not conducting an impulse, so it's just resting. Let's stop there. <laughs> on Wednesday, we're going to find out how you conduct electricity through those neurons. <clears throat> we said at rest, there is a net negative charge on the inside of the cell relative to the outside because the inside of the cell has anions that can't get out. The outside of the cell has sodium ions that really can't get in. Uh, and we said that there are channels with gates in the membrane that potassium has two different channels that it can go through. One of them is gated and is closed at rest. The other one is always open. We said there's only one type of channel for sodium. It's gated and it's closed at rest. Now because of that, if you, if you think about this for a minute, potassium ions are able to move to the inside of the cell. Why are they going to move to the inside of the cell? Potassium has what kind of a charge? Plus, inside the char cell is negative, <coughs> unlike charge attracted. So potassium begins to move into the cell. Right? It's attracted by those anions that are in there. Eventually, enough potassium accumulates inside the cell that for every potassium that moves in by the electrical force, one will leave by diffusion, by a diffusion force. Can you see that you're going to reach an equilibrium? The potassium begins to accumulate in here, and eventually, for every one that comes in from that electrical attraction, one will leave by the diffusion force. So we've reached an equilibrium, and we call that an equilibrium potential. And if all we had to do was think about potassium and nothing else, it turns out that the resting potential for potassium would be actually somewhere around minus 90 millivolts. But we know that the resting cell, remember from Monday what the charge is normally on a resting cell? Minus 70, right? And so there must be something else going on, and it turns out that small amounts of sodium actually leak in. Right? So small amounts of sodium leak in, and because the small amounts of sodium leak in, what charges on sodium? It's a fat ion, it's positive. So as it goes in, it moves the resting potential a little bit closer to zero. So instead of being at minus 90, we're at minus 70. And I think it's helpful when you do these things to think of a number line. Right, so here's zero, here's minus 90, and I'm telling you that the rest of the potential is actually about minus 70 because a little bit of sodium has leaked in, and sodium is a cation, so it tends to make the inside a little bit more positive than what it would be just due to potassium. Okay, so at rest, the resting nerve cell has a minus 70 millivolts. Because that membrane is selectively permeable, it lets potassium in, doesn't really let sodium in other than a little bit of, of leakage.
the uh, leakage that occurs, any potassium going out, sodium coming in, is corrected by the sodium potassium pump that we've already talked about that requires ATP. Right? So it's constantly pumping, keeping that potential back where it's supposed to be. So now we want to talk about not the resting nerve cell, but the actual movement of electrical charges down the nerve cell membrane. Something that we call an action potential. Okay? Action potential. Remember, potential meant the potential to do work and meant voltage. So action, a changing voltage that's going to occur. Okay? An action potential. We can define it as the depolarization and repolarization of the nerve cell membrane. I'm not going to ask you for these definitions. They'll make sense to you in a minute, right? But it's the depolarization and repolarization of the nerve cell membrane. Another way that we could define it is we could say it's a self-propagating wave of electronegativity that travels along the surface of the nerve cell membrane. Again, don't, you don't have to memorize that. It'll make sense in a minute. Self-propagating means what? It makes itself happen, right? And electronegativity, we know it. It's going to be something negative. It's going to move along the membrane. It'll make more sense as we, we go through this. So, if we're going to have an action potential, we've got to have a stimulus. The stimulus can be mechanical, electrical, or chemical. Okay? So we need a stimulus in order to have an action potential. Mechanical, electrical, or chemical. Mechanical, you tap your finger. There's a mechanical stimulus. Electrical, take a 9-volt battery, put it on your tongue, see what happens. <coughs> chemical, drop some lemon juice on your tongue. Chemical, mechanical, electrical stimuli. Right? Not only do we need to have that stimulus, but it has to be of a threshold value. It has to be great enough to cause this to occur. It has to be a threshold value. So right now, somebody's probably lecturing over in 102, lecture forum 102. I can't hear them. Can you hear them? No, because it's below our threshold, right? So the stimulus has to be of a threshold value. If it's not threshold, it's not going to cause an action potential. Yes? What is heat classified as? I would call it mechanical. Right? I mean, it's a thermal thing, so it's, it's mechanical. Uh, if we do receive a stimulus, that stimulus is going to cause the sodium voltage regulated gates to open. Okay, so the stimulus is going to cause the gate to open. So here it is closed. The gate's going to open. And once that gate's open, sodium's going to rush to the inside. Okay, so sodium's going to rush to the inside. Now let's look at that for a minute and see if we can figure out why sodium's going to rush to the inside. We said the outside of the cell had a high sodium concentration. The in cell had a low sodium concentration. Inside of the cell at rest has a negative charge. Outside has a positive charge. Sodium is a cation, right? It's positively charged. So if we open up the gated channel that lets sodium pass through, what's sodium going to do? It's going to rush in because there are two forces that are going to make it rush in. Can you think of the two different forces? There's a positive and negative charge, so the right, so there's an electrical attraction. What's the other force that's going to cause sodium to move in? Diffusion. Diffusion. There's more sodium outside than there is inside. So sodium will rush into the inside of the cell due to those two forces. A electrical attraction and a diffusion force will cause sodium to rush in. And here's one of those rare occasions where we actually have a positive feedback system. The more sodium that goes in and the more the voltage changes inside, so the more the voltage starts to go towards the positive, the more gates will open for sodium. Right? More sodium in, more gates open. More sodium in, more gates open. And so very, very rapidly the gates for sodium open up and sodium is going to rush to the inside. And because sodium has a positive charge, the inside of the cell is going to go from a negative charge to a positive charge, and the outside of the membrane is going to become negative, right? So as sodium rushes to the inside, we're going to go to a positive charge inside and a negative charge outside. 
We say that the membrane has been depolarized. Okay? It's been depolarized. Let's take another look at, at another view here. Okay? So we can see what's occurring here. So this is trying to show graphically what's happening. So we were at rest. We're going to be polarized. And so we can see that the charge on the outside of the membrane, well, excuse me, on the inside of the membrane, is going to go from a net negative all the way up to this net positive, plus 30. If we look down here, look at the sodium diffusion into the cell. Huge amounts. The other thing is pretty interesting. Look at the time axis here. We're talking less than a millisecond. What's a millisecond? A thousandth of a second. I don't know what a thousandth of a second is, right? I mean, I can kind of understand hundreds of seconds. Uh, tenths are pretty easy, hundreds a little bit. I don't have a clue what a thousandth is, but we can measure it on an oscilloscope, what a thousandth of a second is. And so these are less than a thousandth of a millisecond, uh, right? Less than a thousandth of a second. Uh, things that, that, going, that are going to occur. So the sodium rushes in. When we get to plus 30 millivolts, that change in voltage with the inside becoming positive causes all of the sodium gates to close. So these channels, these proteins, are sensitive to the voltage. And once you get enough sodium inside to that plus 30 millivolts, all those gates close. So they slam shut. We're not going to allow any more sodium to go in. Okay? So the membrane is now depolarized. It went from a minus 70 to a plus 30. How many total millivolts is that? A hundred millivolts change, right? From a minus 70 clear up to a plus 30. Question? No? So now that all the positive sodium is on the inside, how is it changed the outside cell name? Cell mem membrane negative. Is, is yeah. So there's a good question there. You know, positive and negative are relative terms. They're relative terms. And let's let's just for a minute think about this. Let, let's draw a little diagram to help us understand this concept. So here's the axon. Here's inside. And I'm going to show potassium ions here. I'll show just four. Now remember. There's also a net negative uh, inside because of the anions that can't get out. How about on the outside, I'll just use my blue pen here for sodiums. Now, I've got four potassiums inside, five sodiums outside. Remember, plus and minus are relative terms. So where is it most positive? Outside. Where is it most negative? inside, because there's only four positives inside. Again, it's relative terms. So what we've said is that sodium has rushed to the inside during depolarization. If I just move one of them in, where is it now the most positive? Inside, and it's negative outside. And the reality is this is really more like how this occurs. Not all of the sodium rushes in, just some of the sodium molecules rush to the inside. And joining with the potassium that's in there, they make the inside now have a positive charge relative to the outside. And so we are now at a plus 30 millivolts relative to the outside. This is depolarization. Now, in order to send an impulse, we have to have this depolarization occurring. But we want to repolarize the membrane also, right? We need to get it back so it can take another impulse. Otherwise, you'll have one thought about depolarization. You'd never be able to have another thought. That'd be it, right? Depolarized, you never have another thought. We want to repolarize the membrane. So that's the next step that we have to do is we need to repolarize the membrane. Repolarization involves the movement of potassium to the outside. So repolarization is going to move, involve the movement of potassium to the outside. When we depolarize that membrane, the gated potassium channels are going to open. Remember there were two types of potassium channels, gated and non-gated. The gated potassium channels are going to open, and potassium is going to rush to the outside, and it will rush to the outside 
for two reasons. What are the two reasons that the TASM will rush to the outside? There's a difference in charge, right? The outside's negative, and TASM has a positive charge, so it's going to rush to the outside. There's that negative, right? I'm the one before. And what else is going to make potassium rush out? There's a diffusion gradient, right? Where's the most potassium? Inside the cell. So potassium is going to rush from the inside of the cell to the outside through its already open channels and through the newly open gated channels. And as potassium rushes out, it's going to make the outside of the cell once again positive and the inside of the cell once again negative. So we're going to repolarize the membrane, and let's, let's look at our diagram here, this, this kind of diagram that I did with my colors. So we said during depolarization, sodium rushed in, but during repolarization, potassium is going to rush out. Well, what if I just make one of those potassiums go out? Where is it now the most positive? Outside, and it's negative on the inside. So again, not all of the potassium rushes out, just some of the potassium molecules rush out. And enough potassium rushes out to repolarize the membrane, bringing it back to a negative 70 millivolts, negative inside relative to the outside. And we can go and look at that graph. Right, so this diagram is trying to show this idea that potassium you can see the diffusion of potassium here. Potassium is rushing out, and as the potassium rushes out, we're going to drive our potential back down to minus 70. Okay? Due to the movement of potassium out, going outside, we have repolarized the membrane. So we depolarize and repolarize. And again, this takes milliseconds, less than a millisecond. Really, right? So less than a millisecond for this. Actually, this diagram is running the whole thing a little bit more than a millisecond, but thousands of seconds. Yes. So when the cell's at rest, though, only one of the channels is open for potassium, right? So only one, one type. Yes. So that one channel doesn't cause enough potassium to rush out. Yeah. So potassium. So the question is, at rest, that channel, the open channel for potassium, didn't cause potassium to rush out. There was no reason for potassium to rush out. Because remember, at rest, the inside of the cell had a net negative charge. And so potassium was constantly being attracted to the inside. Sodium was attracted to the inside too, but it couldn't get in because its channels were closed. So very, very short amount of time for this, this to occur. One of the things that we need to look at for a minute is what I call return to the resting state, and that is you know, this, this is happening in, in milliseconds. But if you keep depolarizing and repolarizing the cell, right? Depolarize, repolarize, depolarize, repolarize. If you think about that for a minute, if we were looking at my red colors here and my blue colors, if we keep doing this, letting the sodium go in, and then the potassium going out, right? Eventually, do you see that the system would run down? Right, eventually, sodium and potassium would be not where they're supposed to be, right? We'd have potassium on the outside, sodium on the inside, and the system wouldn't work anymore. Luckily for us, we have the sodium-potassium pump that's always pumping away, returning sodium to the outside, potassium to the inside, so that the system remains charged up. Now, that pump is relatively slow, but it's always running, and it can get the sodium back to the outside, potassium back to the inside. I would like to use a car analogy here, folks. It, it works for me. Maybe this will work for you. Your car right now, the battery's charged up, right? So you know you could go out, put your key in, and you could turn the starter. So you have the stimulate, that's the stimulus, and the ele electrons would flow, and it would make your starter turn. So if we went to your car and we disconnect the alternator, the generator, the, the alternator, would your car still start? Say yes. <laughs> yes, your car will still start because the battery's charged up. Your alternator light would come on, but you could drive home. And tomorrow you could drive again, right? The car would still start, but your pump wouldn't be working anymore. 
Right? So the electron pump that we call an alternator in a car would no longer be working. And Monday, when you got ready to come to school to take this test, you would go to start it and it would go, click, 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 and it wouldn't start. Right? Just when you needed it the most. So the problem that occurred was you depolarized, repolarized, depolarized, repolarized in a sense, but you weren't keeping the pump up because your alternator was unplugged. You weren't keeping the battery charged. We've got to keep the battery charged by having that sodium potassium pump constantly pumping it up. Now sometimes I'll have students say, you know, when a person dies, where does the electricity go? Well, it's kind of like saying when your battery dies, where did the electricity go? Right? If you think for a minute, when you die, your cells are no longer able to metabolize. The mitochondria can no longer make ATP. If you can't make ATP, what's going to happen to our sodium potassium pump? It's going to run down, and if it runs down, you can't send electrical impulses. And if you can't send electrical impulses, you're not with us anymore. Right? The system has, the pump has run down. Yes? So don't they say that your fingernails and your hair actually grows a little bit? Yeah, you know, I've heard that. So the question is, don't they say, like your, say your fingernails and hair grow a little bit? I've heard that. I, I don't believe that that really occurs. I think really what happens is your skin starts to dehydrate small amounts, which makes it appear that the fingernails and hair have grown slightly. That's my, my opinion. I, I don't think that there's metabolism. You can go online and go read about it. They can show you how many... Uh, for how many minutes metabolism occurs after death. So it's not immediate everywhere, but it's not going to let those hair and fingernails grow. All right, so the uh, return to resting state is about the pump running. Uh, all or none law. So it turns out that when we look at action potentials, this depolarization or repolarization of the nerve cell membrane, we say that action potentials are all or none. That is, they either fire or they don't fire. There's no partial. Right? So either they send an impulse or they don't send an impulse. In a sense, it's kind of like starting your car. Either your car starts or it doesn't start. Right? It either started it up or it didn't. So an action potential either occurs or it doesn't. So we say that it is all or none. The propagation of the impulse. How does the impulse propagate down the neuron? Right? How does the impulse propagate down the neuron? So, you know, you, you have a thought in your head that you want to move your index finger. How does the impulse get from here to here? It doesn't do any good to have an action potential just in one spot. We've got to propagate that impulse all the way down to our finger. So we want to look at how this propagation occurs. And this diagram is trying to show how that happens, that if you have an action potential at one spot on the axon, on the neuron, on the axon, once we depolarize this area, can you see that it's been depolarized? Negative on the outside, right? Once we depolarize that area, because it's positive inside now and negative on the outside, the positive and negatives attract side to side, and so we're going to start to destabilize the next area. Right? Pluses are going to be pulled to that minus. These minuses will be pulled to that plus, And it will open up the sodium channels at that next area. And so the impulse is going to actually propagate down the axon. Remember a few minutes ago I said an action potential is a self-propagating wave of electronegativity. Do you see the electronegativity traveling down the surface of the nerve cell membrane? Kind of like dominoes, right? When one falls, the next one falls. So the fact that we depolarize one area means the next area will depo depolarize, and the next area. And it's showing that right behind it comes repolarization. Yes? What keeps it from going back the other way? Yeah, so Nan asked a really question. What keeps it going from going back the other way? One, it takes some amount of time to do this repolarization. But when we start to talk about multiple neurons, we'll find that the synapse stops it from going back the other way. The synapse only allows it to go one direction. But if I go and stimulate right here, that impulse can go in both directions. But the synapse is going to stop it from going backwards across to another neuron. We're going to get to that in a, in a minute.
something called saltatory conductance. Okay? Saltatory conductance. Saltatory conductance is the leaping of the impulse from one node of Ron BA to the next node of Ron BA. So we learned about those nodes of Ron BA and the myelin sheets a minute ago, on Monday, right? Uh, there must be some reason to have those nodes. The reason we have those nodes is it allows the impulse to jump from one node to the next node to the next node so that we don't actually have to depolarize or repolarize all along the axon. Instead, we can do it just at the nodes. This allows for very rapid conductance of the impulse because the impulse, the action potential can leap from one to the next to the next. Um, in large motor neurons, we can get up to 250 miles per hour in terms of the, the speed of the impulse. Uh, 250 miles an hour, that's not that fast. Well, how many miles is it from my brain to my finger? And as far as I can tell, it seems instantaneous, right? As soon as I have the thought to move my finger, it moves. Well, think about it. I had to send the electrical impulse all the way down to my finger, and I had to cause the depolarization of muscle tissue and the sliding filament theory to occur. But it seems like it's in real time, doesn't it? Because it happens so quickly. So, saltatory conductance allows for this rapid travel by leaping the impulse from one node to the next. When I first learned that term, saltatory conductance, I said, oh, it probably has something to do with the fact that it's salt. It didn't have anything to do with the word salt. It turns out it comes from the Latin, which means saltare, means to leap. And so it's the leaping of the impulse from one node to the next node to the next node. Very, very rapid conduction by having saltatory conductance. Refractory time, the time required for the membrane to repolarize so that it can receive the next impulse. Okay? There's a refractory time, time that's required for it to receive a new stimulus. So before I talk about this, let's, let's do my car analogy for a minute. You go out and you put your key in the ignition, you start to turn the key over, and they say, oh wait, I forgot, and you turn it back to, to off, and then you turn it on again. You've all experienced this, and all of a sudden it goes, right? It makes this horrible grinding sound. You say, what the heck happened there? There's a refractory time, right? So you cause the starter motor to go into the flywheel. It started the flywheel moving, then you pull the starter back out and you try to cause the plunge back in while the flyer wheel was moving and it couldn't hit it, right? Because it was already moving. So there's a refractory time when you try to start your car. There's a refractory time when you try to stimulate a nerve. So if you stimulate a nerve and you stimulate it again right behind there, there's a certain amount of time that's required to get depolarization and repolarization so it can conduct a new impulse. Another analogy maybe I can give you would be, I don't want to probably try this experiment on your own at home, but when I was a kid, one of the things we would sometimes do is we would put our, our bicycle up on something and we'd start spinning the tires and we'd put our hands out next to the spokes and let the fingers hit those spokes. And if you got the, the tire spinning fast enough, pretty soon it almost felt like it was a continuous piece of metal rather than individual spokes. Right? Well, how come? because there was a refractory time that was required for my depolarization and repolarization of the sensory nerves to notice that there was a difference, right? That it had gone on, up, on, up, and it's fast enough, pretty soon it just feels like it's on all the time. So there's a certain amount of time that's required for the nerve to repolarize before it can receive the next impulse, and we call that the refractory time. Well, when we look at this refractory time, it should make some sense to you that if we depolarize the neuron, and it's in the process of depolarizing, trying to stimulate it again when it's depolarizing, nothing's going to happen. It's already been stimulated. When it starts to repolarize, we can keep trying here, but nothing will happen when it's still already in the positive mode. But once we start to get down here into the negative territory again, then certainly we can stimulate it and it will respond. Right? So there's a refractory time. And this first bit of refractory time, we actually give a special name. We call this the 
absolute refractory period because no matter what you do, the neuron can't respond. It absolutely can't. Most neurons take a little longer to normally respond than just that absolute refractory period. So here we have this time they're saying the relative refractory period that comes next. And it turns out that during this relative refractory period, if you use a very strong stimulus, stronger than normal, you can get that neuron to respond. But normally it won't, right? Unless you have a very strong stimulus. So we call that the relative refractory period that comes after the absolute refractory period. Here we have coding for stimulus intensity. And I ask the question here, if action potentials are all or none, how do we code for stimulus intensity? Right? How do you know I'm talking very softly or very loudly? There must be some way to code for stimulus intensity, even though the neurons are all or none. Right? To see the problem? If they're all or none, it's kind of like going over the light. It's either on or it's off. Well, how could it be that you have somewhere in between? And it turns out that our nervous system has two ways that it can code for stimulus intensity. One of these ways is something that we call temporal summation. Temporal means time. Right? Temporal means time. And so temporal summation involves increasing the frequency of the impulse on the neuron. Right? Increasing the frequency of the impulse on the neuron. Well, maybe you had some neuron, let's go back to my idea, maybe feeling the spokes on the, the bicycle. I said, don't be careful if you decide to do that, folks. You don't want to get your fingers in there, right? Uh, so if we go in there and I stimulate it, maybe I can start stimulating it faster and faster. And if I, instead of one impulse per second, maybe it's two per second, three per second, five per second, ten per second, right? I can stimulate it faster and faster and faster. We call that temporal summation. Okay? You can use the same neuron and send it more frequently. Temporal summation. The other way that we code is by doing something that we call spatial summation. We can send the impulse over more neurons. Right? So we can recruit more neurons and send the impulse over more neurons. And we call that spatial summation. In a sense, we're kind of talking about here how they send radio waves to your radio in your car, folks. So FM, how, what does FM stand for? Frequency modulated, right? So we change how fast. And I know you, most of you probably don't know this, but there's another band on your radio called AM. Okay? Uh, AM, what's the A stand for? Amplitude modulation. So how big the wave is. So it's kind of like that, right? So we can do a temporal summation, frequency, or we can do the amplitude, recruit more neurons to carry the impulse. Maybe one more thought. That, this is how I've talked about this temporal summation uh, and, and, and refractive periods. Your refractory periods for some of your large neurons, like motor neurons, are about 1 2500 of a second. 1 2500th of a second. So if your refractory period was 1 2500th of a second, how many impulses could you carry in a second? 2500 impulses in a second. I think that's incredible. Right? 2500 impulses in a second you can carry on those, those neurons. <coughs> Lastly here, something that we call graded potentials. Okay? So graded potentials. So a graded potential occurs at synapses and can be graded. That is, they don't have to be all or none, which is kind of goes against what we just talked about. But right, we said neurons are all or none, the action potentials, all or none. But when we look at the receptors and the synapses that are attached to these receptors, it turns out that they don't have to be all or none. They can be graded. So you can have a little stimulus that causes a little what we call graded potential. They're trying to show this, right? So we get a little potential. 
a bigger stimulus, we get a greater potential. So at the receptors, they don't have to be all or none. They can be graded. Okay? They can vary. All right, so draw your line there for exam number one. Draw your line.